there a specific need for this? Mm -hmm. Was there a specific need for this? To developing the idea of an afterlife? Well, they developed the idea as a result of, like the Muslims, the sort of holy war idea that if you, uh, if you made a holy death, you would be resurrected. All the other people stayed dead. In other words, it was kind of a reward for, um, for having made a, what they call a pious end. It's in the Maccabee books. It's in the book of Daniel. You can read that if you have a time. Anyway, so you, this other idea is what we're talking about is developed much earlier, 600, 700, maybe earlier, B.C. It's in the Deuteronomy book, you know, you know the blessing and the curse. And, uh, the sins of the fathers are visited on the sons of the second, third, or fourth generations. Here's the famous line that we all know about. A voice cries in the wilderness, or a voice cries, prepare in the wilderness a way for the Lord or for Yahweh. Make a straight highway for our God across the desert. Let every valley be filled in. So, okay, yank it out of context. And you've got the John the Baptist presentation in the New Testament for the New Testament or the Gospels, at least the Synoptic Gospels, John is preparing the way for Jesus. That's the Synoptic historical or historiography if you want. I say Synoptic. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are considered the Synoptic Gospels because they are considered to be based on the parallel sources. The parallel material. John is another... Uh, uh, John is another version of things entirely. In, in John, uh, the gospel writer, John the Baptist, specifically says that he's not an, an Elijah, that he isn't a, an Elijah come back to earth. He denies it, uh, whereas the synoptics try to say he was an Elijah come back to life or whatever. So uh, the two contradict often on things like that. But um, so the synoptics have John preparing a way here. Now, since we found the Dead Sea Scrolls, that passage is in the Dead Sea Scrolls too. And it's repeated twice in one of the most important documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it's used in exactly the same way early Christianity uses, except it's applied to the <coughs> community. That the community is preparing a way for God in the wilderness by being perfectly righteous and studying Torah. That's what the scroll says. And uh, <coughs> this is the time of the preparation of the way the, um, the community rule says, and it repeats it twice. And the preparation of the way is the study of Torah. That, that's what they said. So it's just like 180 degrees the opposite of early Christianity. 180 degrees the opposite. Because for uh, Christianity, the preparation of way is the ab abolition of Torah, if you will. At least that's the Pauline presentation of what preparation of the way entails. So the Paul doesn't use the, uh, the passage. So this is the most famous passage, uh, probably in all of scripture, at least in, in Isaiah right there. But let's look at it in its context. Let every valley be filled in. I see you, you can pull it and, and, and allegorize it. But then if you look at it in context, it's entirely different uh, kettle of fish or state of affairs. In other words, it's not just a man saying, here I am, there's going to be someone coming after me. Oh no. At every valley be filled in, every mountain be made low, every cliff become a plain. In other words, let's, let's make the wilderness easier on people. Even the scroll interpretation, in my mind, is closer to Isaiah because the scrolls are saying, let's go out in the wilderness away from a corrupt society and let's, by pure righteousness and the practice of pure righteousness in the camp world in the wilderness, uh, bring the holy angels and the final apocalyptic war against all evil on the earth into being. That, that's what the community world is saying. So we have, uh, we're very fortunate in the 20th century to have found these documents because we now have a totally different view of these things uh, to look at and you can take your choice what you think is uh, appropriate or not. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all mankind shall see it for the mouth of the Lord has spoken and the voice cries 
commands cry and uh, what you like cry all flesh is grass if some of you've been and ever in my um, religious diversity class ethnic religious diversity uh, we've been doing Walt Whitman and he obviously very much uh, moved by these passages and his whole work he calls leaves of grass probably right after this passage is here all flesh is grass a child came to me Whitman said and all full of grass and asked me what is the grass and I said how should I answer the child he said I do not know what the grass is myself and he goes on like that but he's obviously you know, picking up on these same passages in Isaiah as is the author of the uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic that period in the 1850s, 60s, people were very, uh, very uh, moved by these prophetical works. And uh, it's a sad uh, commentary on our own time. Most people are not anymore. At least they don't read them. Go up on the high mountain, joyful messenger to Zion. Shout with a loud voice, joyful messenger to Jerusalem. So what's the message? Here is your God. Here is the Lord coming with power. Well, you see, this is a this is a war God. This is a warlike God. This is a this is an angry God. This is a, this is not a love fest. This is not a turn your cheek God. This is not a God who's a, uh, if you, I'm not against that ethic, but it's a more Mediterranean Hellenistic uh, Platonic ethic. If you hit me on the left cheek, I'll turn the right cheek, and so on. No, this is glory in the fact that the God is going to devour flesh. That I'm not for it, but I'm just telling you, trying to make it. This is glory in the fact that the, this war is going to separate out, uh, you know, basically, as the scrolls put it, the sons of light from the sons of darkness. And the um, scrolls have an actual war scroll based on, on all of this. Anyway, he's coming with power. In the New Testament, you pick that up too, that you have, but you'll see the uh, Jesus or the Son of Man standing on the right hand of the Lord, uh, ready to come with power. So you have all those things picking up on these passages from Isaiah in the New Testament too. But this, to my mind, is more, you know, um, fleshy, more earthly, more this worldly. His arm is subduing things. It's, it's a warlike power, you see. Not the power to resurrect from the dead necessarily, or do miracles, or stop bleeding ladies. It's a power to, uh, to devour evil in an unfortunately uh, very uh, overwhelming apocalyptic war, if you want to call it that. The arm subduing all things, because 